Uh, as we look at the book of Colossians, uh, he's going to talk about the gospel, the power of the gospel. And the question I have as we think about this, and I think Paul would ask us is, the power of the gospel for what? For what purpose is it? Now, if the power of the gospel is to solve my problems or to diminish my problems or to make suffering easier, um, then we set ourselves up for a fair amount of disillusion, like uh, the examples that I've mentioned from some of my friends. Sometimes what I think has happened to us as Christians uh, here in America is that we take the gospel and we think that its prime application is toward the symptoms with which I, I, live, I, I have to deal with in my life, rather than the power of the gospel to deal with the root issues in my life that cause these symptoms. Whenever we think that the gospel is, is to deal with my symptoms, or we, we may not even think, it just happens this way, we are going to set ourselves up for disillusion or discouragement when our, systems, our symptoms don't go away. Uh, this is what Paul is dealing with when he talks to the, uh, what, the Colossians. Oftentimes when I, when I speak or talk to uh, Christians, and, when I, and I have wrestled with this in my own life for many, many years, is what really is the purpose of the gospel? What is it that I'm really hoping will happen as a result of knowing the gospel? And I think for a lot of us, it can be summed up in this. There's some type of fulfilling expectation, a fulfillment of expectation, or some fulfilling experience that I'm hoping for. That can be either personally or in my emotional world or in my marriage or with my kids or through work uh, or my health. There's some type of fulfilling experience. And what Paul would say to us in this passage today is there's something deeper that, that the gospel is out for. And I think, uh, and I would like to put it in these two words, there's a sturdier perseverance where we find the power of the gospel. Not that our life is easier, but in the midst of a very difficult and disappointing world, there's something that anchors me like nothing else will that allows me to persevere when life gets difficult. Uh, in your handout, it's easy to turn biblical Christianity into something that pleases us rather than biblical Christianity turning us into someone that pleases God. That's another way of saying what I want to say out of this passage today. The book of Colossians was written uh, by Paul uh, somewhere between the years 52 and 55 A.D. We don't know if he ever visited uh, Colossae, the uh, city there, uh, which is in the middle of modern-day Turkey, that, that valley, Lycra Valley there. Um, but there were certainly people in his, men that he was training on his mission team that went there, and a church was begun, uh, and the church began growing. And out of that church in Colossae, there was a what we think of in, the, in this book as the Colossian heresy, which said something like this. There were false teachers that came in and said, well, it's good that you've start, started with the gospel. We're happy about that. But, but there's, some, there's some type of spiritual knowledge, deeper knowledge that you need to tap into that's not in the gospel. And Paul didn't tell you that. And Epaphras didn't tell you that. Nobody in the ministry. But we who are, and this is sort of from, from Gnosticism, uh, are sort of enlightened, we can help you be the spiritual elite through this secret knowledge uh, and or through uh, more uh, fervent discipline in your spiritual, uh, your spiritual attitudes and disciplines. Uh, and Paul is addressing this. He says, no, 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 no. The gospel, in its nutshell, if properly understood, is everything we need, not just for salvation, but for our growth. There's no sense of something else needed somewhere to make you a spiritual elite. So we'll start off here, Colossians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. He begins by saying, implying here, that these false teachers who've come in and told you, well, Paul didn't really give you all the goods. He comes in and gives his street cred here. Uh, I'm an apostle, which at that time meant somebody who had seen the risen Christ of which there might have been about a total of 550 or so, roughly, uh, and not just seen the risen Christ, but was a leader in the early church that other people looked for. Uh, and sometimes this word apostle is used as a church planter. But he's saying, uh, you know, I'm not just some guy that just kind of came by this just kind of and kind of winging it, you know, just kind of said, there's something here. But then he says, I'm an apostle, not just because I decided to, but he says, by the will of God. 
to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. Now, what's interesting to me is, is, is the words that Paul uses at the very beginning of this letter to sort of define what the Christian life is and what it's not by what he doesn't say. He doesn't say to those who are fulfilled in Jesus and spiritually satisfied all the time. He says two things very different. To the holy and faithful brothers. Holy meaning that to you have been set apart by God and are living for his purposes, not just your purposes. And faithful, meaning not that we do this uh, perfectly, but that our intent is to be faithful people as we follow Christ. This defines what he's doing is defining uh, some of the pictures of what it means to be a Christian. And then he says, he gives them a blessing. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Grace is unmerited favor. So I don't deserve it. And Paul would say, exactly. That's the wonder of this. Grace to you. This is how God looks at you with favor. No more of wrath and no more of uh, r- the rolling of divine eyes when he thinks about you and your failures. His attitude toward attitude toward you is wanting to bless you with his his presence and all of the gifts that he determines are appropriate at any given time in your life and peace to you meaning that we have peace with God we can have peace with others not that everything goes just swimmingly with other people but as it relates to relationships that are difficult there's a sense in which I can be at peace even in those difficult situations and peace with myself the idea Grace and peace. He doesn't say, I hope you have a great spiritual experience and that you really feel close to God. Now, I like it when that happens. But those are not the most important things he's saying. Now, verse 3 says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Uh, That's a picture of God's grace through Paul to them. That's, That's how he thinks of them. When he thinks of these people, he's thankful. And he prays for them in a delighted way. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. Again, not their spiritual satisfaction or we feel so close to God or I'm just so glad I'm a Christian. Their faith in Christ, not their faith in Christ so that I get the life that I want, get the blessings. Their faith in Christ. And the love, not just the love towards people that we already love and like, but he says for all the saints, for all the other Christians that are around you. There's something about being in a church uh, where you have a lot of different kinds of people. And in terms of trying to learn how to love people, uh, there are some people you just don't get along with, naturally. That's not uncommon. Of course it's like that. But one of the things that happens in a church, what's supposed to happen is that we're supposed to, through difficulties and through those things where there are rough edges, uh, we learn how to love different kinds of people. It's like a laboratory. When I was in college, a pre-med student, uh, it's one thing to sit in, in chemistry uh, class and, uh, and learn organic chemistry and all the different formulas you're supposed to memorize. It's quite another thing to go into the lab and to try to put some of these things into practice in the lab with actual chemicals. I remember thinking, I'm going to blow this place up because I just don't know enough about this. What I'm learning in the class is not enough to protect me and all my fellow lab mates in this particular sense. Um, The faith and love, verse 5, that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven that you already heard about in the word of truth. Now, this is one of these very surprising things to me about about chapter 1, is this faith and love that come from the people, that are in the people, aren't there just by themselves. They come because of what he says, of the hope. There's something deeper inside of them stored up for you because of the hope stored up, the hope stored up for you in heaven. Faith and love, just not kind of out of nowhere. They come from something that's in their heart. And that is, what he says is, is that you already know because of the gospel what's coming. What's going to happen in heaven. And because of that, that strengthens your faith now in the midst of difficult situations. And it gives you a different kind of love, God's kind of love, that enables you to love difficult people now because you know it's not going to last forever. There's something good coming. The good stored up for you in heaven 
that you've already heard about in the word of truth. Now, when I think about this thing of stored up in heaven, he's talking about anticipation. Uh, I'm familiar with anticipation, and, and so are you. Uh, I remember when we were uh, engaged uh, and our wedding day was coming. We were married in Fort Lauderdale, and uh, we got married there, and then we spent the first night there in Fort Lauderdale. And then the rest of the week, we went down to uh, Key Largo, and I remember calling up the hotel for our first night, making a reservation, and the, calling Key Largo on this, this cool little kind of cabana type, type of place, and uh, where we were going to be for a week. Had both those reservations in my wallet. And for weeks, the anticipation of being able to be with Mindy at reservation number one and reservation number two brought me a lot of joy. I wasn't already on my honeymoon, but just the anticipation of what was coming provided something very different. Uh, and that's what he's describing here. Now he says, this, this hope you have, you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel. And here he equates the gospel with truth. Uh, what kind of truth is he talking about? Uh, for Christians who take the Bible seriously, we have an understanding, something of who God is. We have an understanding of how we're made as human beings, made in his image, made for relationship. We have uh, truth about how it is that we screw these things up and why things go all haywire. And we have information, truth about how God rectifies the situation of our brokenness and brings us into a relationship with him where we are the beloved and we belong to him and belong to one another. We have a chance to build our lives uh, on the foundation of Christ and then to um, take that and bridge that to other people. The gospel built on truth. That's the beginning. That's his start. Verse 6, he says, all over the world, now he's describing the effect of this gospel, is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's glory in all of its truth. I remember when I was younger thinking about, um, I was told that the gospel is a Western invention. It, uh, it, it provided the, the basis, the fundamentals uh, for the West, Western civilization. And at the time I thought, yeah, that makes sense. However, what Paul says here is that's not how it started. This gospel didn't start uh, in the center of Europe with educated people. It started in the Middle East in the very uh, crucible of Judaism and at the center, or at one of the outposts of the center, of Roman dominance in the world. Pagan Roman religion. Greek mythology, Roman mythology. Uh, hardly Western in its origins. Uh, it began to move east towards India. It began to move southwest towards Africa. It took a while before it finally jumped onto the European continent. And what he says is, all over the, the world, in whatever particular place you want to talk about, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. And he has the imagery, the illustration here, of a gospel that's alive. You plant seeds, and, and after a while you look at, wow, look what happened here. The seeds that, 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 that germinate and sprout up are people and churches in any particular culture, just as it had been doing among you <coughs> since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Verse 9, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to. Now, what would you think Paul would pray for these folks? I suspect if you ask the average person in a, in a Bible-believing church uh, what Paul would pray, uh, without thinking, it would be, I'm praying that there would be healthier marriages and that the kids would, would grow up to, to be reflective of who Christ is. And I'm praying that the, the, the folks that are, are involved in sales will have better commissions and that those MRI results that come back from the doctor will be good results. Now, all those are good things. No, that's not a problem with those things. But if whatever you're going to pray, whatever Paul's going to pray, you would assume he's going to pray the, 
most important thing. And what he's praying is not for the symptoms, but for the roots of what causes symptoms in our human uh, nature. Praying and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding, uh, as opposed to my will. Uh, that is our human malady, is I, I think I know what I need, and I go about that in my daily life and in my daily relationships. And if I continue to do that, left unchecked, I'm going to make a mess of things. It's just a matter of time. Sometimes it's the erosion of relationships. Sometimes it's going to be outer failure of some sort in a public way, and other times it's going to be something in, in my inner world uh, or my, my emotional world where I'm dealing with stuff that I thought I would never have to deal with. This is the root he's talking about. This root must change. I cannot be a person who's living for my will and expect that things are going to go well over a long period of time. That's a bad assumption, Paul would say. Uh, verse 10, And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, uh, please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Yeah. Whenever the Christian thinks of that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, probably the first thing that most of us think is, I'm just unworthy. And Paul would say, well, of course, of course, all of us are unworthy of the gospel of Christ. He's not praying that you may live a life worthy of the Lord, meaning look at how bad you're doing and the failure you are as a Christian. He's not, he's not using it in that sense. He says, lift up your eyes higher than you normally do. Think about living on that plane. Uh, when I was a kid, I don't remember what I had done wrong uh, in this particular case, but I remember my dad sitting down with me and him saying, he said, Seth, you are a gatchel. I'd never really thought of myself like that. You are a gatchel. And what you do has an effect on everybody else at our house. That's how people think about us. He said, it's important how you bear that name. Now, again, I don't remember what it was that I had done. But I do remember the point of that talk. Was he was trying to lift my eyes higher than what I normally approach life as. Uh, and to think of living my life as a gatchel and not just for what I wanted. Uh, and then he says, Paul says, and that we may please him in every way as opposed to just pleasing myself. Uh, when I was growing up, I loved sports, and uh, a lot of times I'd go outside in the driveway and shoot hoops. Love to play basketball. Uh, sometimes uh, I'd go down to the park with some friends and play baseball. Love to get some guys together and play football. Always had fun doing those things. But there was something better than even those things I enjoyed doing. And that was pleasing my dad. As I look back on those years, I remember thinking I had such a hunger to want to see a smile on my face, on my dad's face, because of something I had done or something I had said. Something that made him proud. Something that brought him, ple something that brought him pleasure. Something that in the air said, that's my boy, and I'm glad you're my son. He's a, Paul is appealing to that for us too, that we may please him in every way. Bearing fruit in every good work, this has to do with how we live our lives and our actions as well as uh, the fruit of, uh, and as we relate to other people and the effects that we have on other people as we relate to them, which would always be good to give more thought to. Growing in the knowledge of God. In other words, he's dealing again with the roots in our issues, not just our symptoms. Now, there are a couple stunners in this passage, and this next verse is the first. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so you may have a much easier life. So suffering won't be so difficult. So your marriage will be more fulfilling. So you'll feel a lot closer to God. So your kids will turn out like you really want them to. And that's not what he says. And I think that for most of us in, in America, as we think about our Christian life, this verse should be a stunner. 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. This is a stunner because this is not what we normally expect as we think about the Christian life. When I was a kid, I remember there was a song that uh, my mother uh, taught me uh, in, in, and she meant well. Uh, Sticks and stones can break my bones. Words can never hurt me. And I remember for a while I used that in grade school. And then I began to discover that that really wasn't very true. Sticks and stones could break my bones, but words were a lot harder. And as an adolescent, I began to, to, to see that the difficulties of life and the pain of life. And as time went on, I got older and older in my teen years uh, and into high school and college. And ever since, I've discovered, in general, the longer I live, the harder it seems life is. It is, it is there, I mean, there are plenty of good things about life. Don't hear me. Be Mr. Gloom here. But if, if I assume that life is supposed to be sort of this, this life of ease as a Christian, I have set myself up uh, for a lot of disillusionment. Notice what he says the power of the gospel is for in this verse. Strengthened with all power. Those two Greek words, strengthen and power, are from the same Greek word dunamis. One's a verb, one's a noun. It's the word we get, our, our word dynamite or dynamo. Strengthened with strength, piled on, according to his glorious might, so you may have great endurance. That word endurance is the Greek word hupomone, which is usually used regarding tough circumstances. Great endurance regarding tough circumstances that just don't change. And then patience, it's the word macrothumia, which is the, the Greek word for long suffering. Times when life just is tough and it remains tough. And it remains tough and tougher than we ever imagined. And here, macrothumia is usually used related to people, difficult people who've treated you badly. Paul says, you're not, not to run away, not to hide, but there's something here to be learned about patience uh, as you're relating to these people. Uh, it's not so much that I'm supposed to have this power, again, to, to, to deal away with suffering, but to somehow be able to endure and to persevere in these difficult circumstances or people in such a way that Christ is put on display. This seems to be the point of what he's saying, not the, the eradication of my, my difficulties. And he continues in verse 11, and here is the second stunner in this passage. When you think about perseverance and endurance, it's easy to think just kind of gloom, kind of gloom and doom. Oh, am I just going to hang on for all it's worth? And sometimes life seems that way. But the very next phrase, he says, and joyfully giving thanks. And this is part of where Christ gets put on display. How is it that in the midst of tough circumstances and tough relationships, I can have some amount of joy? And Paul is going to describe two sources of joy that I think are just amazing. Yeah, and most of you already know these, but in the context of this passage, I find this so amazing. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. So I'm going to call this joy number one. My immediate circumstances do not provide me with joy. Difficult circumstances or difficult relationships. But joy number one is, he says, look forward. Look forward to what's coming. And what he points to is, he says, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. He points them towards heaven. But someday, you're going to be there. For me, I've lived now 65 years. Uh, 500 years from now, uh, I will have lived, or 650 years from now, I will have lived there 10 times longer than I have here. And 6,500 years from now, I will have lived 100 years more, 100 times more there than I have here. That's what Paul's trying to say. Think about what's coming. Look forward. This is joy number one. Now he says, Who, He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. 
Meaning that what I have coming in heaven is not because I've been such a great guy or I'm trying so hard or I'm trying to be religious or spiritual. No, no, no. It has nothing to do with me. It's because the gospel, in the gospel, I have been qualified. He's qualified me. I have a birth certificate that I had nothing to do with, is the idea. Or I remember when Mindy and I were newly young marrieds and we were just trying to scratch out a living. I remember that I called the bank several times to see if we qualified for a loan. And I, the first few times, I think the banker needed a lot of self-control to keep from laughing uh, because our two salaries combined were pretty pitiful. Uh, thankfully, we didn't have much debt, but in the, in the um, or any debt, but thankfully, um, the, the banker said, well, Mr. Gatch, you don't qualify yet for a loan. Uh, we need to have a lot more money, a lot more salary, a lot more for down payment. Um, but what if the bank called me one day and said, Mr. Gatchel, you now qualify for a loan for a house? For a house. Well, how did that happen? Well, you have an uncle. His name, his name is Ben. Uncle Ben died, and in his will, he left you $100,000. And it's in an escrow account at our bank. And anytime you want to buy a house within these certain parameters, you qualify. Wow. Ben. Uncle Ben. That's this sense of awe that he has here. You have been qualified. Already done. You're already qualified. This is joy number one, looking forward. And joy number two comes in the next verse. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Joy number two says, don't look forward, look backward. Think back about what's already happened to you in the past. He has rescued you. Think of the SEALs, our Navy SEALs, who head all around the world to rescue people. They're in horrendous situations. We were in a worse situation than any of the, the people they go to rescue. We were in the dominion of darkness. The picture here is of a fortress that there's no way we could get out of, or a dungeon with which we were down in the basement and no key, or a, a Vietnam prisoner of war camp uh, where they were in these little uh, bamboo huts and these places where they could just, uh, they could only communicate by tapping for years. No hope of rescue. That was our situation. And brought us, excavated, moved us into the kingdom of the Son whom he, whom he loves. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption, meaning a ransom was paid. I am free because of the ransom paid at the cross. The forgiveness of sins, and the word forgiveness there means the release from slavery. A release. A, a moving away, a sending away. The Old Testament picture is sin that was sent away on the head of a goat out into the wilderness for the people never to see that sin again. Or here, our redemption is back on the cross. Where all of the things that I have done in my life, all of the things I should have done I didn't do, have been hurled at the cross. And all of the things that I did do I shouldn't have done all my life, he hurled at the cross and stuck on Jesus. And all the things that I've said that I shouldn't have said, hurled at the cross. And all the things that I should have said that I didn't say at the time, hurled at the cross and all of the secret sins and thoughts that I shouldn't have thought, hurled at the cross. Never to see those or have to face those again. They've been sent away. He says, remember that. Joy number one, look forward. Joy number two, look backward. Now let's wrap this up. I was talking to my pastor friend this week uh, who's not been in the ministry, pastoral ministry, for about five years. And we've had long conversations about this. Um, and um, he's aware that God has really been using this in his life in ways that he never anticipated. Uh, his wife is thankful for this time, and so are his sons. And so is he. 
But as we were talking about it this week, and in his day-by-day -day life, he goes to work to a work he doesn't want to go to, and he has to do a lot of things in sales he doesn't like doing. We were talking about this, and I had an image of slaves in antebellum, in the antebellum South. I think 19, 1830s. Cotton fields. Summer heat and humidity. Mississippi. Little log cabins where they had to sleep. Day after day walking out into the fields. Never knowing if the master was going to sell your wife or your children to somebody else. Now, if you know something about history, or American history during this time, and you think about slavery, there are two things, there, there's one thing that comes to mind with two different applications. The first one is this, what we used to call the Negro spiritual, and that is songs that were sung by so many slaves throughout the South. The Negro spiritual. And the ones, that the, the, the ones that I remember the most had the point of joy number one, thinking forward, and joy number two, looking backward. I learned these as kids when I was a kid. Joy number one, looking forward. The great old spiritual. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. That was the chorus of that particular one. A joy, number one, looking forward. The second one that I remember is a joy, what we think of as joy number two, looking back. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? As I was talking to my friend, I asked him the question in the midst of sort of his confusion over these last five years. What would Paul tell those men and women on slave plantations that he would tell you today in your situation? And I think what he would say is what we just read today, these first 14 verses. The gospel. A power, not for what we want necessarily, but for some that, that deals with our symptoms, but a power that deals with the roots of our issues. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that the gospel is precisely what we need, and that even when we go off base in our understanding, and inadvertently we live as Christians as if the gospel is supposed to deal with our symptoms as the primary purpose and we set ourselves up for discouragement and unnecessary disillusionment. Would you help us to hear Paul's words in these first 14 verses? And help us to get our expectations more in line with what you have for us. You desire, even through our difficult situations, to put Christ on display to the people around us. And you give us the power that enables us to do that. No matter how much perseverance or great endurance or long suffering is needed. And because of the hope we have, there's always reason for joy looking forward 
and looking back. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30. You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.